Ten years. Ten long years I've been waiting to play this game. And I finally beat it on the Switch. What's up guys, Sean here, and I'm finally ready to review Tales of Vesperia Definitive Edition on the Nintendo Switch. It's... man, uh, I'm feeling really giddy about it. I can't wait to tell you guys how I feel about it. But, of course, we gotta have a word of history uh, in these reviews. So, hope you guys enjoy the show. Oh, uh, by the way, this is going to be a long one, so grab a snack, grab a drink, sit back, because this is going to be a long ride. Tales of Vesperia comes from a long, renowned line of the Tales franchise straight from Bandai Namco Games. The Tales games are known to provide a manga-slash-anime-like art direction within the game with animated cutscenes to match that style. The franchise was once in a 2D format, eventually transitioning over to 3D. The Tales games were first developed by Wolf Team, having their first ever title, Tales of Fantasia, developed by them. The franchise was ignited thanks to Yoshiharu Gotanda, a former member of Wolf Team and president of Triace the company known for developing the Star Ocean and Valkyrie games. They were working under Telenet Japan during the early days. Then Namco became its major shareholder and the team became Namco Tales Studio. Much of the series was produced by Hideo Baba, starting with Tales of Destiny. Over time, they developed 14 different main Tales games with sequels and spin-offs in between until Telenet Japan dissolved and Namco's Tales Studios merged with Bandai Namco Games. From there on, Bandai Namco Studios has developed three more titles from the main line with Celia 2, Zestria, and Berseria. Between those times came Tales of Vesperia, the 10th main entry in the series. Tales of Vesperia had a two-year cycle starting from 2005. Fun fact, Vesperia was originally planned for the PS2, but the team saw the power and appeal of the 6th generation gaming consoles. Then it released on August 7, 2008, and later August 26 for the North American version. The rest of the regions had to wait as far as June 2009 for the original version. This was the first to play in HD. This was also the first and only time it was ever released exclusively on a Microsoft console, the Xbox 360. It was also during the time when JRPGs only came with English voices for the US version. However, it did feature Troy Baker as Yuri Lowell, its protagonist, which was nice. The reason they only released it for the Xbox was because they saw it was so popular in the West, so they decided to focus on that. During that same time, they had yet to see the capabilities of the PS3. So that explains its inclusion regarding to the 360. Back then, my only exposure to the game was just videos on YouTube, and these videos were only in the English version, of course. And even back in the 2000s, in my opinion, the voice acting was just mediocre at best, but I must give credit where it's due, uh, especially with the fact that they recorded all that dialogue in English entirely, even including the skits, which was kind of rare, I believe. Get, you know, having to put that much effort into recording these uh, this much of dialogue for JRPGs like this back in the day. And it looked fun watching from uh, what I was able to see with the gameplay. It looked like a fighting game. It had, it had that vibe to it. Uh, which was the intention from the developers. Despite only being on the Xbox once upon a time, and we all know how the Japanese feel about playing on Xboxes, Japan had sales of 204,305 units sold by April 2010, making it the second most sold Xbox 360 game in Japan. In the US, 33,000 copies were sold during its first four days then became first in sales during its launch week. The US alone had 410,000 units sold after one year. After that same amount of time, worldwide sales reached to 614,305 units for the Xbox 360. On September 17, 2009, the game was ported to the PS3, and this version featured twice the voice work of the original game had. 
This also had Flynn as a permanent party member and even added a brand new character to the party, Patty Fleur. Also more subplots, skits, main story quests, side quests, costumes along with new features to gameplay such as new attacks, skills, and more. This made the 360 version absolutely obsolete. By September 2011, 465,888 units were the total sold in Japan, over twice the amount of what the Xbox version was capable of. Damn. Though this was widely successful in Japan, Western regions were not on the list to receive their superior version of Vesperia. Although there was word that Troy Baker was recording some dialogue for the PS3 version, so there was some glimmer of hope. However, it never came to the West sadly. The reason why was the strain that occurred on the team for a simultaneous release of the original on top of the fact that there was poor marketing feedback from the West. So the choice became obvious, and I don't blame them for it. This brought a heavy burden to my heart as I realized that the version would only stay in Japan. It just seemed impossible or unreachable for Vesperia to ever come to the West again. Now allow me to digress a little bit here, but it's all related info. Even back around the late 2000s, we still had to import niche Japanese games, especially JRPGs here in the West. And by that time, gaming consoles did not allow any third-party software such as Action Replay and Freeloader to work anymore, which was how we were able to play imported games at all in the first place because of region locking. Even if you had the appropriate system for the game, language barriers were notoriously horrifying in JRPGs, even for me. It just wasn't practical to try anymore. Then about 5 years later, the tables had taken an interesting turn. During the year 2016, gamers took part of a resurgence of the Japanese video game industry. But can you guess what popular game really took part of that resurgence, really took that advantage of the interest of Japanese uh, video game industries? This is where it began. This is where the resurgence, I believe, began. Yes, this is a smartphone, or an iPhone in this case, but a smartphone nonetheless. So, it's a mobile game. Can you guess it? Pokemon Go. Now there were Japanese games like Fire Emblem Fates, but nothing really came close to the popularity of Pokemon Go. I think that's pretty undisputed. There were so many players around the world trying to catch all the Pokemon at parks and all other recreational areas. Whether you were a casual, whether you were a hardcore gamer, kid, adult, it didn't matter. It was so popular that it just got so much exposure. It was a huge phenomenon during its release. The overall popularity carried over and helped Pokemon Sun and Moon later on to break sales records, following a number of Japanese games including Final Fantasy XV added to that success by the end of 2016 and cracked another plateau for Japanese games. Then, 2017 games like Tales of Berseria, Gravity Rush 2, Yakuza 0, Neo, Persona 5, and more were just some of the games that definitely broke the plateau even further. While games like Final Fantasy 7 and Pokemon broke the first wall to bring a wave of Japanese gaming franchises, those other games took it even further. This has now created an ongoing demand for these Japanese games, and it's fucking awesome for someone like me. And so, during the 2018 Microsoft E3 conference, this was announced. What? What? Oh, anime girls. Wait, well, tails. blow my nuts. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Is this the remastered version? Is this Vesperia? Yeah, yeah, this is Vesperia. Uh. 
HD. Definitive edition. Yeah. Come on, dude. There you go. Hawk, you got something out of Xbox. Like, I've been waiting to play this game for years because they brought it to PS3 only in Japan, so. Oh, so you haven't played this yet? No. Mm. Oh, yeah, this is the PS3 one. Yeah, this is the PS3 version. Coming to Xbox now. Oh, well, okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I'll check it out. I'm gonna, I, I, I liked Berseria. Tales games are pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm down. Windows 10, please. Oh, come on. No, come on. Come on. If, yeah, 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 yeah. If it's PS4 or PC, I'll definitely fucking okay. get that. I think it's gonna, it's not gonna just be like fucking next. After 10 years of waiting, man, it just felt so gratifying to find out it was coming to all the major systems, including PC and my favorite, the Nintendo Switch. I was so hyped. This was basically the PS3 version, but with a cleaner look with upscaling and the PS3 DLC costumes here were free. I'll take that. I'm very happy to say that the game has sold almost 1.6 million units across the board worldwide. You know what? I'm very much happy to be a part of that because I love the game absolutely. And therefore I thought the wait all those 10 years anyway really paid off so i am super stoked about that uh that's pretty much my verdict in cliff note fashion but let's go finally break it down to the positives and negatives for this game so whew, man that was a lot wasn't it but we're just getting started first off the graphics were super stylish and very charming in full hd these are the kind of graphics anime or cartoon lovers would love because it really does a really good job emulating that look. Even in 2019, these style of graphics still hold up, which is the beauty of it. Because it's like, if it's as if you're looking at a cartoon. It makes me miss this kind of art direction since recent games like Tales of Berseria kind of try to aim for a more realistic look, which I kind of disagree with. But anyhow, they really have those lovely 2D animated cutscenes from Production IG. Yeah, the guys who made Attack on Titan later on. While there's about only 25 minutes of these cutscenes in total, the other good things definitely make up for it. Even the in-game cutscenes had some cool moments. The environments are pretty good overall, ranging from lively towns to crazy dungeons. I have not much to complain about most of the level designs. The weapon designs are something to commend on. There are some funny ones like the yo-yos for Rita. While the 3D stuff was scaled properly, I think they forgot to update the size on the character portraits in the menu. It looks a little blurry if you ask me. But aside from that, the overall art direction and design is just fantastic across the board. Yuri looks simple, sleek, and yet cool and mysterious. Rita has awesome colors and traces of traditional Japanese designs. The cast as a whole brings in nice color schemes along with their unique and lovable personality traits. The sound and music I definitely found a treat to experience. Now of course I had to experience my first playthrough with Japanese voices all the way through because they always put love and care into the voice dialogue. Speaking of which, this game offered a whole damn lot of awesome voice lines and I loved every minute of it which offered a lot of time to get to really know the characters in the party. The actual music composed by Motoi Sakuraba and Shinji Tamura still hold up along with its graphics. Many of the town's themes are so catchy and everything else really sets the mood well and really helps bring the JRPG experience together. The gameplay is the important piece to this puzzle that really brings it home. However, it does start off slow since you have to progress through the game and unlock all the techniques and mechanics so the game has to gain some momentum before it gets really good. But after playing the first 8 hours, that was when I really started to like the game. It really did feel like playing a fighting game but with those JRPG elements. You can be really creative on how you can put together your attacks or arts 
to potentially create some really cool combos. After gaining Fatal Strikes, which is the ability to insta-kill normal monsters, it's so satisfying to land those as combo enders. Oh. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh. You can also pick up and unlock abilities permanently from weapons if you level them up all the way, and some of them unlock even more arts known as altered arts. It kind of takes some research to find out what works with what, though. And once you unlock the mystic arts, it gets really cool. In fact, this is probably my favorite part of the gameplay. It's just really awesome ultimate attacks. Some of them are really long, but they do do, do a good job like building up the ante anticipation for a number of them. Almost everyone in the party has two Mystic Arts in this uh, version, but Patty Fleur is the exception here, as her uh, Mystic Art consists of a lot of like RNG, so there's a lot of animations to that, and uh, there's a lot there's a lot to see for Patty, so that's really cool. But with that said, you have to go out your way during your second playthrough to really get to uh, really see these uh, Mystic Arts, but at least I was able to witness uh, a good number of them and I was happy with the ones I was able to see. For me, I think Vesperia has the best ones to offer when it comes to Mystic Arts. It just, they just do a really good job for most of them when it comes to the presentation, how it's choreographed, the time length, the the satisfaction like ending to them for the most part. That's just my experience anyway from the Tales games that I played. Um, maybe I'll do someday like a Mystic Arts sort of uh, critiques and comparisons to other games. To really weigh weigh them to each other someday, but for now, uh, for my you know current favorite ones anyway is from Vesperia. Again, that's just my personal take on it. Um, I just can't help it. The, the the presentation with these Mystic Arts is just so cool. You have the ability to play all the other characters besides Yuri, and they all have unique styles of play. I had some fun with Rita and Judith, but Ryuri is just too fun, so I stuck with him most of the way. One of the gameplay features people seem to forget is that it has 4 player co-op, which is really nice whenever you have friends over, so they don't have to just watch you play and sit there, they can play with you. And because of that, if you guys get your characters down and all the controls and all that, you can possibly create some of the most crazy combos in JRPGs, you know, together as a team. But that's not to say that the AI are awful or anything. They do a good job pertaining to their roles, and you can adjust your strategies and formations to best fit your style like in other Tales games. The enemies don't offer too much strategy to fight against with the exception of certain bosses. There is one thing to know while playing these games. While you are grinding to level up your characters, you can earn grade. They're kind of just points you collect every time you battle, and you get more grade if, if, if you do like combos and some other bonuses during the battles. However, grade does not pertain to the gameplay much until you finish the game itself. After starting a new game, you can pretty much have cheats, quote unquote, to buy with grade you've earned from all your grinding. These range from being able to carry 99 of each item, keep skills for each character for the uh, next playthrough, pretty much stuff that makes your future playthroughs a much more relaxing experience to your liking. Also, with the Switch version, it runs smooth both on TV mode and handheld mode, making this definitely a good on-the-go type of game. The puzzles were simple for the most part, although I did overthink one of them, so I took a little more time than I should have. Now this is a Tales game, so for those who know about these Tales games, you'll run into a lot of skits. 
Skits are optional scenes you can watch with the characters further interacting with each other outside of the story in various subjects, comedic or not, to help players really get to know each member more. Whether you discovered a certain amount of monsters, or pulled off your first mystic arc with that character. Now this is the classic format with the characters kind of boxed in, but they are still a charm to look at. And plus they have those half body portraits too, so I felt like it was like the borderline between the classic tales skits and the modern skits you see today. おさん、剣振ったら息切れするもん。俺様も青春に戻りたいね。なさけねえな。心配するな。青年もすぐこうなるさ。ははは。何それ。いやなの。ま、おっさんは後ろで若い俺の勇士に憧れて、モダエ休
Carl is a young warrior who ran away from a lot of things during his time as a guild member, a hunting guild, guild to be exact, and grows so much uh, when he's a part of Yuri's crew as a character and as, I guess as a man, you know, he becomes a man, I guess, um, at some point, and he goes through a lot of shit too as a kid. And this, this guy is so lovable as well. Uh, he's also the tank, so... And not to mention, he also clutched one of my oh. early fights I was struggling, as he is the tank to have. Oh no! Oh! Oh! Carol, with the clutch! Oh! Holy shit! God, that was the first harder one, dude. Oh my god. He's definitely a little guy, but with a big heart. Judith acts as a sex symbol of the party, but also offers her unique and honest viewpoints on things in life, and comes off as a very fascinating character from start to finish. Raven is a mysterious character, besides Yuri, who has his own mission to fulfill. Flynn is Yuri's best friend and noble knight who understands both the good and the bad of the world, but sometimes struggles to cope with Yuri's viewpoints. Patty is a pirate who has amnesia who searches for the truth of her past. Point being, the characters in this party are just phenomenal and you'll love them to the very end. As a whole, the synergy between all these characters is one of the biggest highlights in the game. Each character has their own sort of relationship with each other, like Rita and Carl being kind of like a brother and sister sort of relationship. Of course, Raven is always howling and hollering towards Judith because Raven is kind of like that pervy old guy. But of course, you know, you're, there's that relationship between Yuri and Estelle. They have this really strong connection together and so on and so forth. Tales games tend to do a really good job crafting these characters to such quality and being able to combine them like so it's quite the feat to accomplish. Meanwhile, their allies and enemies have their own bit of fun to the story. The side stories are also fun to pick up along the way, but you have to be careful on certain parts because you'll get locked out from doing them. And these side quests or side stories have some very enticing rewards, so having an online guide with you would help wonders in case you get stuck at some points. As said before, the gameplay has to grow over time, but the storytelling does a great job keeping you going as I wanted to see what would happen next despite already knowing a number of the major spoilers. Now I was able to see all the little in-betweens and little bits and really was able to have it come together for me and I love it from the beginning to the very, very end. Outside of that, there are tons, 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 tons of voice dialogue for the story, skits, and so on, if I haven't said it already. I, I just absolutely loved every minute of it, unlike a recent game I reviewed. And I'm looking at you, World Seeker, motherfucker! As much as I did love Vesperia, there are negatives that I must address in this video. The first negative I wanted to point out was the use of the right stick. It was horrible. Once you unlock enough arts, you can assign those to each direction of the right stick as a shortcut, along with other buttons and such. But the right stick was just not working. My arts were barely coming out from the right stick. It was just not a good experience at the start. So I had to rely on the four arts that were assigned to my left stick. I think you can unlock more shortcuts later on, but for the time being, it was bad. <laughs> Fortunately, the dev team provided a patch rather quickly to fix this problem and other uh, bugs and little things that were adding up to, to become problems. They really should be commended for that. Uh, kudos to them for being uh, rather quick about that and after that patch I had a lot more consistency with the right stick when it comes to using arts from there uh, It was still reading some uh, wrong directions like when I you know sometimes press forward it might it may pre uh, read it as back sometimes because the way I move my right stick anyway, so it's a little sensitive still 
uh, maybe the dead zones could be adjusted or something like that. But otherwise, it was a lot better in comparison to the very first uh, patch or version, I guess, uh, when it first came out. And it's it was such a stark contrast. It was a lot better. So I was able to use more arts uh, along with the ones that were assigned to the L stick. So again, I must commend them for that. Really awesome. So that that was a, that was a problem solved right there. So that was a negative earlier, but uh, thanks to that, it was uh, mostly erased. But uh, I do have one more question for them, it, and it's why not use the D-pad as part of the controls for the art uh, shortcuts? It's just a, a press of a button. So why could that not be a part of the options uh, when it comes to controls anyway? You know, if you're gonna give us that much options already with you know being able to configure what uh, a specific command to a button anyway, at least most of the important ones anyway, um, I feel like the D-pad should have been a part of the art shortcuts anyway. That, that could have been a pretty good way uh, to be more consistent. You know, maybe you don't have to rely on the right stick anymore. But you know, again, you know, it's, it's just always having more options. It's is really helpful when it comes to these kind of games anyway. The next thing I wanted to complain about is the inclusion of Flynn as a party member. To me, it felt like he wasn't there enough even with the second makeover of the game. Patty definitely had more time with the crew. By the end, he will stick with you until the end game, but I just wish he was there with you during more of those story beats so I can have more time to enjoy him more. Flying around in the airship, with its world map was a bit of a pain because there's no clear objective point to go to. It would have been nice to add a couple of things on the navigating side such as point markers. This one is probably the most quote unquote the controversial negative for the game. This involves with the recasting of Yuri's voice on the English side. Troy Baker was the original actor who played him, but this time the casting crew decided to go with Grant George instead. While not a bad voice actor, it was just so strange to not even include him or contact Baker at all. He even said on Twitter he had no idea that the definitive edition was even happening and it just never asked him. It's kind of a shame really since he was very willing to voice Yuri again. So that whole situation was really strange and purists would probably find this very offensive or just improper since I believe everyone was back for this game just to hear uh, Yuri with Troy Baker's voice. I do feel that because I watched those old videos on YouTube in the past with Troy Baker's voice. It would have been a treat to hear him again with those 10 years plus of experience. Now with that said, this video provided me what I need to know. I'm Yuri, what's your name? Should we head back or... I'm Yuri, what's your name? Should we head back, or...? And I thought Grant George was fine during these parts. Yes, there are parts that have very stark contrast from George and Baker's voice uh, as Yuri attacks in battles. This ends now. The Hulgian Blade of Cold as Steel. Rim the infinite darkness. And crush my enemies to nothing. Come, O oh power! Shine, light of the morning star! Try some of this! Heavenly Blade Wing! What really strikes to me is the act of not recasting Baker, and the audio swiping in and out would be a negative on other people who prefer to run English voices and have such sensitive ears to these changes. I, I can understand that. I mean, I could, I could hear some of that myself. Obviously, the Japanese voice option is technically the superior experience since everything is 100% authentic and well-produced and it's all back into this version. There's no swapping out of voice actors or whatever such. And so the English dub fans got the short end of the stick. I even heard that the sound mixing was a bit off, especially during the skits, like the volume was too low or such things like that. 
Some of the level designs were a little repetitive to the point where I thought I went around in the circle during the final level, for example, but I was actually progressing, so I was just like, what? <laughs> there were also moments where I thought I got past this monster, but they just still get the encounter on me. Like, what the hell? What the fuck? Uh... Flying enemies are really messed up when it comes to this situation, often triggering dangerous encounters more frequently if you're not careful because of the nature of their hitboxes. Oh my god, I hate that fucking shit. So dumb. Alright guys, the sorcerer's ring. That ring is trash. The Sorcerer's Ring is a tool you'll pick up somewhat early in the game and it'll act as a key to a number of puzzles in most dungeons. Also, secret passages as well. You can also use it as a means to get the advantage on monsters by hitting them with an energy shot to possibly stun them. And that's where its flaws become apparent. Aiming and hitting them is just horrible! Especially if you're trying to hit them from the higher ground or they have the higher ground. So good luck trying to hit the flying enemies with the ring, motherfucker! Even if it seems to hit them, it doesn't register no matter how much you upgrade this thing. It just doesn't work! Wow. This game sometimes. Who thought that this was okay to let this pass? For the definitive edition. Come on. All right, I gotta calm down a bit. But anyway, the last problem I like to really close out with this one is is the fact that the other vents for this game start to really open up once you start your second playthrough or even more playthroughs, because certain things are locked away behind uh, future playthroughs, just because that's just how it's built. Um, it's really designed for you to really keep playing and playing and playing and I feel like that is a problem for a lot of people nowadays like me who, you know who's older and um, does not have as much time playing these video games uh, because of work or just you know other passions that uh, we want to pursue just whatever situation we're we're in um, that presents a problem for for anyone in that situation in any way um, you really have to dedicate a lot of your time just so you can enjoy more of the game itself. Uh, some of these are locked away. Like I said, uh, the second Mystic Arts are pretty much locked away behind these second playthroughs and, and all that stuff. Because you don't really get to find out how to unlock them until you do more playthroughs anyway. Especially with Yuri's. You, you know, Yuri's Mystic Art, uh, second Mystic Art, excuse me, is actually locked away from uh, the first playthrough. So again, you have you have to play more than once in order to get everything uh, completed. So if you're one of those completionists, um, you gotta play more than once. You can't complete everything in one go, literally. So again, that could be a problem for a number of people like me, but it, it, for anyone who has the time and dedication, this probably isn't uh, viewed as a negative. But I wish they just put more into your first playthrough so that it can really land a much uh, more of a better uh, first impression, I guess, or first time playthrough. Just so like it just, they just leave, um, leave those players um, on a much happier note, more satisfied in any way. Not to say you know that my first time playthrough was really fun, really satisfying, and I just still had a lot of fun with it. I was able to beat this uh, within four, 78 hours, like right under 80 hours, fortunately, because uh, the uh, Namco team actually went ahead and dropped some DLC to help you out with this sort of problem, I guess. So uh, they give you a lot of level ups, a lot of items to really help you recover, materials for more powerful weapons, like, it's like as if they knew this was going to be a problem for people like me, you know, older people in your way, um, that were waiting for this game for 10 years, so, um, you know, that 10 years is, is, um, a good amount of time, right? So, by then, you know, we probably have, like, jobs or just careers to pursue, you know, a lot of things that we have in mind, you know, we're trying to grow up and stuff. 
and you know here comes a game like this that you know it tries to really suck up your time just so that you can just enjoy these things but again this problem is pretty situational i guess but you know i i, I think a number of people can agree with me and yes you can skip the cutscenes on your second playthrough and stuff like that these cutscenes are really long and all they do suck up a lot of your time but even then there's still uh game like just pure gameplay that will suck up your time anyway so either way you just need to put a lot of time and dedication just to enjoy certain parts of the game uh, as well. Woo! Man, that was a lot to say, but we can finally, finally uh, start wrapping things up now that I got that out of my system. So, uh, like I said, I beat it right under 80 hours. I only play these games uh, during uh, my streaming day, so it took a lot longer than it should have. If I just played it on my own time, I would be able to beat it in like two weeks. Since I beat it in 15 total days or 15 total sessions, so there you go, 10, uh, 15 days pretty much, but probably could have been a little less, but who knows. I think this could have been easily over hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of how hours, like I said, there are still things to do after that first playthrough, such as the Sick and Mystic Arts, the, the uh, Colosseum challenges, a lot of the side uh, stories or cutscenes or quests that you might have missed. Uh, after being locked out, there's just so much more to explore. Um, there's so therefore this is this is a lot of content in this game. So um, it is hard to say that this is a negative. You know, it's just again, it's, it, that's a very situational thing. But despite that, um, putting that aside, I enjoyed my playthrough a bit. My uh, from my experience, I enjoyed it. I got uh, what I really needed to know. What makes uh, Vesperia such an awesome game? You know, back in the O the 08s or the 09s of, two, of the 2000s and I definitely was able to get that big piece pretty much or uh, most of that piece anyway I mean like I said there's still more to do and uh, that just that's just um, that's just really fulfilling for me because I've been waiting to play this game for again 10 years and I finally was able to finish it on my favorite system on the nintendo switch so that's like pretty much a cherry on top that's just so awesome to really experience that so again it's just it just feels really good um that entire experience from the reveal to beating the game now and you know as i stand here talking to you guys about it it's just such it feels like a, such a complete experience for me um it feels like one of those like things that i can you know sign off my bucket list now I guess when it comes to gaming so um very much happy with it and if i ever come back to vesperia there's just so much variety uh within this game just waiting to be uh, discovered by players and so therefore there's still still stuff waiting for me oh thank god Whoa. Oh. I'm like fucking sweating bullets. Holy shit. Oh my god. Oh. Look at all that gold, baby. Fuck. Holy sh. Tales of Vesperia is a classic JRPG that's still fun to play now or even later. Uh, I think it. I think it just uh, grows even you know more beautiful. Or it, it, it grows with more charm as it ages because of that. Uh, the the charming graphics, the really fun characters, the awesome story, uh, the combat's really fun, and the music, the sounds, and everything. It's just everything just completes it as a classic JRPG that's pretty much for every JRPG fan out there, classic or modern. The Definitive Edition did a really good job bringing uh, Vesperia to modern consoles with the entire core kind of uh, pr uh, pr maintained when it comes to that authenticity and stuff. It just felt like um, Vesperia pretty much, you know, what I've seen from the videos and stuff. And now I was able to play it, you know, with my own hands and see it on my own TV and stuff. Um, I think the Definitive Edition was a great idea and well executed at that. And so, 
uh, this version is the version to go to when it comes to Tales of Vesperia at its finest. So after all of that, I know there's a lot to talk about when it comes to Tales of Vesperia, but that just shows you how much I love the game. It's 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 just that good. I mean, who would have thought, you know, that this uh, classic JRPG would have me talk this much? But I have been waiting for this game for 10 plus years for a reason, so I think that wait paid off, like I said before. So uh, I'm very much happy to be able to complete this experience. Um, I feel I really feel like it's like a it's gone caught gone full circle in my opinion. It's like one of those things. Like I said, it's a bucket list sort of experience. Now I can check it off. And so with that, it's time to score this baby, Tales of Vesperia Definitive Edition. Uh, after all that, all the time I spent with this game, I'm definitely gonna give this the strongest of nine out of ten when it comes to the score. Uh, it could have been a ten out of ten. Maybe if I played it uh, right at the you know actual launch date or whatever of the PS3 version back when during that uh, generation, but um, you know of course it is expected to feel the outdatedness or the outdated nature of certain parts of the game. It still earns that nine out of ten, and I really, really highly recommend it to all JRPG fans. Really, um, and this is coming from a big JRPG fan like myself. Um, I always love these Tales of, uh, Tales of uh, series games, and I think really Tales of Vesperia takes the cake when it comes to my favorite Tales game of all time. Um, I think, yeah, it's just, it feels good to say that Vesperia is my favorite game. I've been waiting for the, you know, like I said, I've been waiting for 10 years for this. Um, I love the characters, the combat was really fun. Um, and I, 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 you know, especially on the Switch, it's just so perfect. Maybe now that Tales of Vesperia has more success than ever, maybe they'll uh, consider making an anime or something. I don't know. They've already made uh, animes for Destria, the uh, Tales of the Abyss, and Symphonia, um, with their OBAs and stuff like that. Uh, I will have to see about that, but I would like to see where things go when it comes to the main Tales games uh, in the future. I also wanted to add this little tidbit as I was you know putting this project on pause I watched the E3 press conferences and I also of course encountered the Tales of Arise trailer and that looks drastically different in the in the, in the best of ways um, it looks really good and I look really much forward to it of how you know the, the combat will be like plus the Unreal Engine just really making it work uh, for the looks department and you know possibly of course the combat as well so very much looking forward to Tales Arise glad to see that it, um, Tales is still alive and uh, this is something to look forward to uh, most likely this uh, or next year excuse me but putting that aside thank you guys so much for tuning in to watch this video I did put a lot of time into this and uh, hard work and effort uh, for Tales of Vesperia because I love the game that much um, so I really appreciate it if you guys uh, hit the thumbs up if you guys would like the video and uh, any comments related to this video, uh, really appreciate it. Please leave them down below in the uh, comment section. And also, if you want to support the channel any further, uh, I have uh, links to uh, Loot Crate and Into the AM with the promo codes. All that information is in the description. It uh, supports uh, the channel further, and you get something out of it too as well. So, really appreciate that, guys. So, next time on when it comes to reviews it, uh, for games it'll most likely be judgment really can't wait for that game that's uh coming up not too soon from now so until then i'll see you guys in the next video sean out